Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. It is an exciting day for me, and I don't know if it is for you. Uh, maybe you don't even know what's happening today. Today is Super Bowl Sunday. And I, 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 I'm excited. I think, to be honest, I might be one of the only ones, and that's fine. Um, I, I always, I've been watching the Super Bowl pretty much every single year uh, for the past probably 15 years. And it's funny, the two times I missed the watching the Super Bowl, um, I was actually away on missions both times. And so I didn't have the ability to watch the two games. And one of the games was my favorite team, the New England Patriots won against the Los Angeles Rams. You don't really care about any of this information, but I, I, I care about it, right? But if you don't, don't know what the Super Bowl is, it's the championship of the National Football League in the United States. And, and it's the game, the last game of the season to determine who the champion of the league is. They get the Lombardi Trophy, and they'll be forever cemented in history uh, as champions of the National Football League. And again, my favorite team, New England Patriots, they got my helmet right here. I tried this helmet on, it does not fit me. Um, and I, it really hurt when I tried to put it on, I'll be honest. But... It's, it's interesting because the New England Patriots since 2001 have won a record six championships since 2001. They played in the Super Bowl nine times since 2001. And that's almost every other year they're playing in the championship game, my team. This past season, we finished third last in the entire league. It was, a horrible se- it was a horrible season for my team. They're not very good at all. And I heard this heartwarming story the other day about the Super Bowl. And, it's, and it's, the story is this. A man had 50-yard line tickets at the Super Bowl, which is like the best tickets you can get. And as he sits down, another man comes down and asks him. He's had a seat in the top. He comes down and like, hey, uh, I saw the seat next to you is empty. Is there someone supposed to be sitting there? I, I, is someone sitting there today? He said, no, the seat is empty today. And the man says, this is incredible. Uh, who in their right mind, though, would miss the Super Bowl? How could somebody who has tickets to the Super Bowl not use them? And the first man says, well, actually, the seat belongs to me. I was supposed to come to my wife, and she passed away. And this is the first Super Bowl we haven't been together since we got married in 1987. And the man says, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. That's terrible, but couldn't you have found someone else, a friend or a relative or even a neighbor to take the seat? And the man shook his head and said, no, they're all at the funeral. <laughs> it's just a joke, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I heard that the other day, and I thought it was, like, honestly, I thought it was funny. But I I love sports, as you probably know by now. I love sports. It's been an important part of my life um, since I was young. You know, I played sports. I played pretty high-level sports. I played pretty much all the sports you can play in Canada. The one sport I'm not very good at is hockey because I'm not very good at skating. And, And when I try and stop, it's painful because I usually fall. And everyone laughs at me. And then they say, hey, you want to come play hockey with us? I'm like, not if you're going to laugh at me. Because I, I don't want to be embarrassed. But I love sports. And sports have this ability, if you like sports, um, this, sports has this ability to bring people together, right? It has this ability to gather a city, uh, to cheer for a team, to, to win, or to, to gather people together. And we've seen so many times that we love when we see these underdog stories of teams who, who overcome the obstacles, who overcome having the, the, the cap space or having the talent on the roster and they end up winning the league or they end up winning championships. We love these underdog stories. There's nothing like watching our hockey team keep on winning and winning. Seeing a, a team come from disaster to a winning record. And sports have this ability to bring us together because it's an exciting thing where we can actually be unified over something. It's interesting because there's so much divide over people, but sometimes what brings them together is sports. It, it, people can come together from different backgrounds or different beliefs, and they can come and cheer on a team. And as much as I love watching sports, I miss playing sports, I think, more than I miss watching. I miss playing uh, football, which was my favorite sport to play. And when, when you graduate and when you stop playing, there's not a lot of opportunities to keep on playing football. Some other sports, it's easy to find leagues or whatever you can play. Football's not one of those things, and I miss playing. I miss the moments where my team, we would win, or the, the, the moments even that we would lose and we'd be together, the moments where we were laughing together or crying together. I miss performing well. I, I miss even misunderperforming. 
There's nothing like playing. I miss playing sports. And it's so funny because there's times I literally dream about playing sports again. I dream about it. And then I wake up and I'm kind of like relieved, but I'm also kind of disappointed, you know, that it was a dream. But I think so many times when it comes to, to life and when it comes to the gospel, I think so many people, especially those who go to church, those who serve and follow Jesus, what happens is that we've become spectators of the gospel. We love to watch what God is doing, but I think sometimes it can be a challenge for us to actually participate in the sharing and spreading of the gospel. For so long, maybe some of us who've been sitting in the, ble- in the bleachers or we've been sitting on our couches watches, watching other people play in the game and watch other people across the world, missionaries and pastors and people spread the gospel and bring healing and bring miracles. And we love to watch it, but there's a difference between being a spectator of the gospel than it is to be a participator and a contributor to the gospel. I think there's a difference between spectating from watching and actually participating in the game. And I think that in North America, we, the, the, that we need a church and we need followers of Jesus who are willing to step into the game and bring Jesus and be the light wherever we go. I think our, our country is, is in a desperate cry for truth and our, our country is in a desperate cry for the good news of the gospel. And I think so many times some of us, and those of us maybe have gone to church for a long time, there's moments where we sit back and we watch it happen even though we're supposed to be participating and contributing to the gospel. I think it's time for us to get in the game. Today, Super Bowl Sunday, I thought, wow, I get to talk about sports, you know. It's time to get in the game. That we have to stop just being spectators. And for a while, I think when we start our relationship with Jesus, we start as spectators sometimes, right? We're watching. We're learning. And then sometimes we, you know, we stop spectating. We get down to the field and we put on our, our practice pads. We're on the practice roster. And then eventually we get into the game. And it's this process of discipleship where we start as spectators. But I, we can't stay as spectators. We can't stay in a place where we only watch and we don't actually participate. And as much as sports bring people together, Jesus and the church are supposed to more. You know, there's more people who gather around the globe to to go to church and learn about Jesus that are going to watch the Super Bowl today. And last year, from one of my from my from my statistics, it was it was somewhere in the hundreds of thousands of people watched the Super Bowl last year. Hundreds of millions, I mean, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions of people. But there's more people who participated in church even today than will watch this game today. It's supposed to gather us and bring us together. This is what Paul said in regards to the game, or how he called it, it would be the race. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24, he says, Don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? He says, So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what, I, what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. This is, this is Paul. I discipline my body like an athlete. See, we're running a race. As we go through life, we're running a race. We all are. But what's interesting about the race is we're all at different places, maybe. Maybe we all have a different pace. We're all in different places when it comes to this race. And the goal that we have is not for a trophy. It's not for a medal. It's not for a participation award. It's not for the MVP, but it's for the eternal prize. We have to get in the game, and we have to not just get in the game, but we got to start fighting to win. Fighting for our brothers and our sisters, and fighting for our children, and fighting for our spouses as spreaders of the gospel. Not just to make it to the finish line, but to make it. So I have three uh, steps that I think can help us when it comes to getting in the game. And number one is what is your strategy? You know, football. If you don't know much about it, football is probably one of the most strategic sports um, because the plays last an average, I think it's 2.5 seconds long. And it's like, everyone's like, that's not very good. Hockey plays last 20 minutes sometimes, right? 
But what's interesting about football is that every single play, there's so much strategy and, and understanding that goes into it and who's supposed to be where and who they're supposed to guard. We have to have a strategy if we want to win. If we want to finish the race, we have to actually have a strategy. Strategy is so important to winning. This either comes from the coach or from the leader, and for our case, it comes from Jesus, the one who paved the way, the one who taught the truth, and who was disciplined to keep on going even when it was challenging. See, the race requires discipline. It's not always easy to keep on going. You know, I've seen people training for marathons. A marathon is one of the, 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 the hardest athletic feats that the average person can actually conquer. A marathon. And the record for a marathon is just like just over two hours, which is unbelievable. Just over, like I, every time I think about that, I'm like, man, it takes me sometimes two hours just to get out of my bed in the morning. You know what I mean? Like these guys are running an entire race in that amount of time. We follow Jesus, and when Jesus, Jesus said go, and how often do we stay? The strategy is there, go. How often do we stay? See, Jesus taught us to love. He said love, and how often do we hate? Jesus said to forgive, and how often do we hold on to grudges from our past? See, Jesus said to take care of people, but how often, how many times do we start ignoring people? And Jesus said to keep on knocking, right? And often, how many times do we give up? Jesus said to pray, and how many times do we work? Jesus said to rest, but how many times are we too busy to make that a part of our schedule? I think if we want to know the strategy, if we want to know the game plan, it's already written down. Jesus taught so many incredible, incredible things. The Bible is filled with insight and wisdom and ways to discipline ourselves and ways to grow. It's already written down. We already have the game plan. We already have the strategy. It's so many times we ignore the strategy because we want to create it on our own. We have to listen to the game plan that's already been laid out before us in the scriptures. We have the words of Jesus so much more accessible than any time in history. And so how often do we ignore it? Romans 10, 17 says this. So faith comes from hearing. That is hearing the good news about Christ. If we want to expand our faith, if we want to keep on fighting when persecution comes and obstacles come, we got to learn how to hear the word and put it into practice. Let it be a part of our story. What is your strategy for winning? What is your strategy for, for, for growing closer to Jesus? What is your strategy when it comes to sh telling your friends about Jesus? What is your strategy? Because if you don't create a strategy... If you don't know what the Bible teaches us, it's never going to just happen by accident. What do you do daily to grow to your faith? What do you do weekly to grow your faith? What about monthly or yearly? Every 10 years, what do you do to grow your faith and to build perseverance in your life? Strategy matters. Because it won't happen by accident. It takes discipline. It takes effort. It takes hard work. So funny when you read through it, it doesn't say the race is going to be easy because no race is easy. No race is easy. It might be easy to get, say, 100 meters, but to beat Usain Bolt, it's not going to be easy and highly unlikely. It's not always easy to win the race. It's, it might be, you might be able to finish eventually. You might make it to the finish line eventually. But what if we put in the work and we started fighting for the people we love the most and started sharing Jesus? We have to have a strategy for it. And then number two is this is who's on your team. This matters. Who do you have fighting with you? Who do you have running beside you? In a lot of these races, they, they have people who will come in as they train to set the pace. So they'll run for a short time so someone can keep up to the pace. And then someone else will come in who's fresh. They just keep up with the pace. That's how they can train their bodies to actually keep on going is with who's around them. Who's on your team? It matters if the people are in the right positions. Do you have the right balance of older players and younger players? I think so many times as generations, we get so caught up in trying to learn from the people who are the closest in age to us. But there's so much we can learn from older generations, and there's so much we can learn from younger generations. Can we learn from each other? Do you have people on your team who are younger than you and who are older than you to inspire you? 
And the younger people, how can you inspire them and share your wisdom and share your life with them? Who is on your team? Are there people in, on your team that probably don't need to be on your team anymore? It's about time they retired from the team. Are there people that you got to say, you know what, I got to let go of you for a season so I can get healthy so that way I can continue to keep running the race. In 1 Corinthians 12, it brings this concept of the body of Christ and how we make up his body. It's probably a portion of scripture maybe you're familiar with. But it says this in uh, verse uh, 12. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require the special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. A portion of scripture we've read a lot. But I think this really just speaks, in my mind, to the, to the idea that we need one another. We need each other to be on our teams. We need one another to be on our, on our rosters. We need one another to be fighting alongside us and running with us. We can't try and go through life by ourselves because we're never going to accomplish the fullness of what God can do all on our own. We all have a different role when it comes to the gospel. We all have different gifts and different talents and different abilities that make the team better, that make the body better, that make the church better when we come together and we are fighting and we're running in unity. Each of us has a different position or a different role and we need to stop comparing our roles. I think I, I've had so many people in my life over the years, especially in ministry, be like, man, I wish I could do what you do. Like, I wish I, wish I could do what you do, or I wish I could do what they do. I wish, I wish that was my job, or I wish that was my position. And we've gotten so caught up in making this hierarchy in church positions or in life's positions of this is a better job because it's more in the spotlight. It doesn't matter. What matters is using our talents, using the things that God has given us to serve each other and to serve the church and to serve the body. That's what matters. We need to stop comparing with one another and start serving one another in our roles to build the kingdom. We sometimes wish we had a certain skill set or a certain thing and we don't actually have it. And so what happens is, waiting for the opportunity to serve in that place when there's so many other opportunities available and so many different positions and so many different things that need to happen. We're waiting for our moment to be the hand, but God's called us to be a foot. we got to start walking in what God has called us to do. We're not called to run on our own, to run together. It might be at different paces. It might be even in different locations. We gotta learn to walk in unity together. If God wanted you to be like them, He would have made you like them. If God wanted me to be like you, He would have made me like you. We need each other to serve one another. 
And the last thought I have today is this, is the instant replay. Now, the instant replay is such a fascinating thing in sports. I was, I was looking at it this week. Baseball was the last sport to actually introduce instant replay. Now, the biggest concern with instant replay, if you know, is that it slows the game down if they're trying to look over a call or look over a goal that, that, that shouldn't be allowed. It takes time. And so that's kind of the debate on it. But instant replay has really just changed sports because it's made it more, mostly more uh, real, like in the sense of the calls should normally go the right way. But there's, 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 there's so much interesting about instant replay, and I think it kind of serves two purposes. Number one, the instant replay, what does it do? It celebrates. Right? You get to see the big goal again immediately. Have you ever been to like Roger's place, you go to a hockey game, and you sit far up? Sometimes it can be hard to see what's actually going on. In Calgary, I'm not joking, at the Saddle Dome, which is the Calgary Hockey Stadium, there's these seats that go up, and the Flame Stadium, the Saddle Dome, is shaped so weird. If you've ever seen it, it like kind of dips. There's seats where you barely can see the ice. I'm not joking. So they literally have t- uh, like screens on top, so you can see here rather than looking down, so you can actually see what's happening. It's true. I've sat there before. It's horrible. It's kind of cool to be in the environment, but you're not actually watching the game live, to be honest. You're in the environment. But what it does, it celebrates. You get to see the big goal or the big save or the big play or the big birdie. You get to see, you get to see it again instantly. You get to relive some of sports' biggest moments immediately and celebrate with other fans and in our own minds. We get to celebrate instantly what's happening. But number two, what the instant replay does is it proves it proves the truth. Now, when I played sports, there was this saying that would say, film doesn't lie, which basically means what you're watching on film of yourself is the truth. Because what would happen is true star coaches would come and be like, hey, that play, you missed that tackle or you missed that thing. And I'm like, no, I didn't. No. No, it's your fault. Like, no, I didn't say that because that's disrespectful. I would have been cut, you know. But I didn't say it that way. But I was on my mind. I was like, no, I didn't do it. The next day, he'd watch film with me. He's like, watch. I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right, you know. It proves, if we watch the instant replays, it it proves the truth. What you see on film is the truth. You see it immediately after something big happens, whether a penalty or a close call, and you get to see it to hopefully uncover the truth, which again, doesn't always happen. Now how I imagine this, can you imagine if in your job the same thing happened? Because you think about these athletes, right? They're, they're performing to the best of their abilities, hopefully. They're going, and all of a sudden they make, make a big mistake, and now millions of people across the world are watching their mistake live. Over and over and over. Imagine that was you at work. How many times you've ran through a yellow light, and, and, and it's just replayed over, and millions of people are watching every single mistake you make. You think about all the things at work that you've done or the, the things that you've done by accident. They're like, oh, shoot, I hope no one saw that. And it's like, now everyone's seeing it. That's how I kind of imagine it in, in everyday life. With multiple camera angles and everyone just starts booing you for it. Think about sports fans. We love to celebrate our team and we love to boo our team. It's like they've been good for like 19 games and then they lose. We're like, yeah, and they suck. We need a whole new team. We need a new coach, right? <laughs> But I think one thing that the instant replay does for us as fathers of Jesus, it proves our guilt, right? It shows us our sin. I think we can all look back at some moments, man, and all the dirty, broken parts of us, we see it and we know it. I'm just going to invite Chelsea to, to come up here. It, it shows it. I and mean, when we look back, we can sometimes see the highlight reel, and sometimes it's not a highlight reel. It's like a fail video, you know? All our moments of failure and mistakes. But Jesus, the beautiful thing is Jesus comes and takes the penalty for us. He sits in the sin bin instead of us. I was so fired up when I wrote that. <laughs> I was like, anyway, it's just, sometimes I write stuff and I'm like, that's awesome. And then it's like, it's not that good, you know. He sees it happen. What does he do? He takes our place. He goes instead of us. He sees our brokenness. He sees our failure on instant replay. It's like, yo, that wasn't great. He's like, I'll take that punishment for you. So when we look back in time, really what an instant replay is, we look back and we see what happened. Some of us, we look back, we're not seeing a lot of the good things. 
We don't often see some of the great things. But oftentimes, what do we do when we look back? What do we see? We see shame. But rather than look back and see shame, do you know what we can do? We can look back and see uh, gratitude. Why? Because of where Jesus rescued us from. Our biggest failure, our biggest sin. The place that, you know, we deserve punishment. And he said, no, I'm taking it. We don't have to look back and see shame. We can see gratitude that the author of creation took our punishment so that we could be free. Romans 8, 1. Now this verse comes right after Romans 7, which has two commonly referred portions of Scripture. One is uh, God's law reveals our sin. And then the second portion that comes right after is struggling with sin. These two portions, right? This is what it says, verse chapter 1. So now, there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. I think this verse here, I've read this verse and we've read this verse, maybe even I've memorized. This is so powerful, this verse. That yes, God's law reveals our sin, putting it up on the big board and we see it. We're struggling with sin. But so now there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. See, the replay may, repro- may prove our guilt. But when we belong to Jesus, we give up the punishment to him. He takes it. I think most of us, when we get to the end of our lives, we, we want to maybe have similar wording to what Paul said near the end of his, of his career, you know. 2 Timothy 4, verse 6 to 8. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of death is near. I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. And I have remained faithful. You know, I think if we were to look, at least for me, if I were to look, you know, when I come to the end of my life, this is what I want to be known for. That I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I remain faithful. It says, now, and now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. The same prize that we have access to. I think if we want to get to the end, for me, we want to know that we finished the race that we fought the good fight and that we remained faithful. Faithful in our relationships, faithful in our churches and faithful in our families and faithful with our kids. That we kept on fighting even when it was tough. That we finished the race even though we wanted to quit. Even though we didn't know what the next 10 minutes would look like. How we kept the faith, we fought the good fight, and we finished the race. That's what I think I want to be known for. And I'm not talking about for me. Like I'm not, because even Paul, he starts. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. Paul had a, Paul didn't have the most glamorous life. Shipwrecks and imprisonments and beatings. Not always easy. The race isn't going to be easy. But I fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have remained faithful. That's what I want to be known for. That I got in the game. That I didn't just stay in the race because that's what my family did. It's just part of my history. But I did it because I wanted to see people come with me. The prize awaits the crown of righteousness, which is the Lord. That's who's waiting for us. The one who saved us is waiting for us. He's coming back. You 
And our takeaway today is this, is that is the advancement of the gospel is essential. And we need to be contributors, not spectators. It's essential. It's not just like, if you have time, it's like, make time. Let's be contributors, not just spectators. Let's get in the game. Let's put in the, put in the work. Let's be there for each other when we fall down. Let's be there to pick each other back up. And be there for one another. Let's be unified as a team, as a family. And your family and across our city, that's my prayer is unification among the churches. Stop fighting with each other and start serving each other. How can we serve one another? How can we serve the churches in our city? How can we serve the other uh, Christian organizations in our city? How can we serve them? That's why we partner with different organizations because we want to it's not just about us it's about serving the other people already doing the work in every race they have like the water stations right sometimes that's what we're like here's some water you got it there's a video I saw of the Olympics I think it was the Olympics the guy was running he was like in, he was like in first place and he missed getting his water and the guy behind him turned around grabbed water and ran up to him and was like yo here's some water it's a crazy story sometimes sports do crazy things but let's be contributors, not spectators. Let's get in the game. It's time to get out of the bleachers. Time to get off the couch. Time to put the popcorn down and step into the game. Maybe keep the popcorn and bring it with you, you know? We all need a snack sometimes. There's nothing, there's nothing like popcorn. That's the whole thought. There's nothing like it. I love it. God, we, we thank you for this moment. We thank you that, that, that you called us to be active. Called us to be active in our faith, not passive. You called us to actually get in the race and run, and not just run to, to, for the thought of finishing, but the, the thought to win. And what's the prize? It's you. We run for you. We fight for you and we go for you. God, help us overcome the things that are maybe holding us back from being contributors. Some of the things that have got us so caught up in spectating sometimes, but to step in and that our faith will actually be active. And God, I thank you that the advancement of the gospel is essential. Help us walk in that. In Jesus' name, amen.